Hi, so uh, thank you, John Fisher, for joining me today. Um, as you know, I'm a big fan and uh, I'm really excited that you're going to be doing this for me and you're launching the uh, Real Life Career Story. So you're going to be our first introduction to this set of interviews. And um, the brief you sent, you've had an amazing career. So I kind of met you a little bit later on when I was studying your change curve model as part of my own qualification. So for me, having you here is a, a, a massive thing for me. And I'm, as you know, I'm really excited to have you. So really, I kind of just want to hand over to you to, for you to be able to kind of tell us your journey, where you started and, and what, what brought you to where you are right now. Okay, thank you, Tina. No pressure there then, eh? <laughs> um, so, uh, my journey, I grew up, I was born into and grew up in a, a small village on the end of the Yorkshire Dales, just near the town called Skipton. So, went to a secondary modern school there. Failed my 11 plus in those days, went to secondary modern school. And at some stage during my, uh, around 10 I suddenly decided I wanted to join the Royal Air Force. No idea why, no history, nothing at all uh, in there, but just wanted to join the Royal Air Force. So that became the focus and goal from 10 to 16. Um, when I left school with a couple of O-levels in those days and CSEs, I then applied for the Air Force, uh, went down for the selection centre weekend, and while I was there, they put a list of jobs that were available on the screen and sort of said, choose three from this list of 30 or 40 jobs, something like that. So hadn't a clue, didn't know a right lot, just gone through the normal education and left school. Um, and I saw one that said aircraft radar. So I thought, that sounds interesting. Not a clue, really. <laughs> uh, so I put that down. I then looked and saw another one that said aircraft communications. So I thought, oh, I'll put um, aircraft on the first one. So let's be consistent and put aircraft on the second one. So I put air comms down. I then um, saw a bit further on in the list and it said ground radar. So the same thought process, saw something radar on the first one, so let's keep it, so put all three down. And was lucky enough to get through the selection centre uh, and was the only person out of the group of 12 that I was in uh, to get through and got a craft apprenticeship as an aircraft radar um, technician. So then spent the next two years at an REF base learning how to fix uh, radar systems uh, on aeroplanes uh, and then got posted to second line uh, servicing. So the aircraft would be taken off the radar, uh, off the aeroplane, sorry, and I would then fix it in, in a service bay and then it would be sent back to be fitted back onto the the aircraft. I uh, did that for a few years uh, in the UK, then got posted to Germany uh, and worked on laser uh, rangefinders for a while and then was posted to a fighter squadron working on their radars uh, and then came back. Yeah, <laughs> quite nice working on that for jet fighters and in Germany. Um, and then came back from my last tour of duty in the UK having done 13 years by the time I finished, I went to a small little backwater airfield that's main role was teaching the Navy how to fly. So I was um, a sort of shift leader and looked after the aircraft communication systems uh, on, on that and then spent my last six months on Jet Provosts uh, looking after their radar radio systems on that. When I came out, I joined a company called Singer Link Miles, who built aircraft simulators and training rigs and were based down at Worthing. So, uh, and that was just a normal progression almost, became a customer support engineer. So spent the next four or five years designing and installing modifications to aircraft 
simulators and I spent some time as the um, installation test and commissioning engineer for some tornado simulators on 3REF bases. So that was interesting and gave me exposure to really working with different people, customer service type of exposure. Um, however, it's fair to say during my time towards the back end of the Air Force time, and certainly at Link Miles, I was more or less a poster boy for something called the imposter syndrome, which is where you know you're doing a reasonable job, but you're just waiting to be discovered in that it's not you. Yeah. And being an engineer just wasn't me. I could do it. I even enjoyed it, enjoyed the travel. I've been lucky enough to see a lot of certainly Europe and interesting bits of the world. Uh, but it just wasn't me. And um, then at sort of 31, 32, I did an open university degree in psychology because I'd always been interested in what made people tick and why they did what they did. So the OU just looked like a natural starting place and doing that. So I uh, came across uh, somebody called George Kelly, who's had his philosophy has had a big influence on my life, which talks about really we anticipate what's going to happen based on our past experience and then act as if that's true, just modifying it. And he also said that we're different people in different situations and circumstances. And I just knew that reflected me uh, and encouraged that journey. So um, after five years, I left Link Miles while still doing the degree. I joined British Aerospace, uh, BAE Systems as is now, and started working in project management. Uh, luckily initially on training rigs and simulators so I kept that network the links and the, the knowledge but going more into a sort of management type situation of pulling the cords helping everybody sort of engaging motivating people to deliver whatever the program was to time cost and quality and while I was doing that I'm um, still doing the old university. I also did a City and Guilds 730, which was adult and further education teacher training, because I wanted to move into some sort of consultancy type training development role that, that supported helping people, but I didn't want to be a teacher. So yeah. it's more of the, yeah, sorry about that, Tina, but it was more of the HR side of life and, and those sort of things that interested me. So spent most of the 1990s in project management uh, and then British Aerospace launched five company values and I got a job on the customer value team. So my main role was to design and deliver training awareness raising workshops, interventions, to get people customer focused. Uh, Dawn Chorus in the background of your dog. Yeah, just trying to ignore him a little bit there, but yeah. I think, yeah. <laughs> no, it's nice. <laughs> <laughs> sort of goes with me a little bit, that. Just, just, just ignore the dog. Just. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's the sort of thing, I suppose, that's been consistent through my life. Things have just happened, uh, and I've more or less gone with that, or gone with my gut instinct and gone with my feeling that's that's led me there so the open university degree felt right at the time yeah. I came across the expression when the student is ready the teacher will appear and I love that because it just that's says that the time's right to do what you want it will be right for you to do it so it, it's a case of the decisions you make now shouldn't define the rest of your life yeah. and it's about getting that wider exposure, learning more things, finding what really engages you, and then you'll be able to take that to great heights for you and whoever else you deal with. So the customer value team was really the start of me not working from then on. So for about the last 20 years, I haven't really had a job. I've just enjoyed myself. Yeah. Um, but massively but successfully as well. Thank you, thank you. You're, you're too kind. Um, and as part of that, I gained more sort of interpersonal or 
communication engagement experience. So I did some volunteer counselling for uh, National Children's Home and for an alcohol abuse agency in Preston, where I live at the moment. Uh, and so that helped me start being able to understand, put some of that sort of skills uh, around motivation engagement with people into practice and learn and develop myself in a in a way that, that supported and where my change curve came from with people and the impact on people from some of the decisions or the changes that's happening for them and the impact on their sense of identity uh, that then led into a short term in hr just to get that tick in the box which then led me into a training partner role uh, and I did that training partner, sort of organising training, delivering training, uh, and I've done that effectively from then on. So from around 2000, I spent the last uh, 17 years actively doing training, training development and delivery uh, as a full-time role across a wide variety. I've done it for a charity that was a training organisation and have um, helped assess people for MVQs uh, and as part of that apprenticeship development uh, and I've worked with manufacturing organisations, councils, a wide variety of organisations delivering leadership management development training back into them and supporting them. Um, after I left BAE Systems I then went to work for a uh, a utilities company, Balfour Beta Utilities, uh, uh, supporting across the board of their workforce in getting a bit more understanding of communication skills, some leadership development skills, uh, and this. And during that time, I got a master's in organizational psychology uh, around ch and use change is the main theme of it, which has always been a sort of interest around how do people change, why do they and don't they change uh, within that area. Uh, and that, after Balfour Beta Utilities, I worked then for a charity, and I am now ironically doing leadership and management training, mainly back into a, a massive multinational financial institution um, across that and, and supporting them. So that's a sort of, in a nutshell, the life journey interspaced with that has been really some education, some uh, awareness raising. So I got my master's. Uh, I got a business practitioner, uh, practitioner in neuro-linguistic programming, NLP, uh, managed teams on and off. But managing teams isn't my, uh, doesn't make my heart leap with joy but working with teams really does uh, around there so I suppose in many ways that's the journey from being a reasonable engineer and having imposter syndrome of just waiting to be caught through to loving what I do now and um, getting invited to give workshops and to give papers at conferences uh, around the world so I've just come back from Portugal last month um, where I was an invited workshop deliverer and I've just come back two days ago from a conference in Edinburgh where I gave a paper and was part of an invited workshop symposium. So a little boy from a village in the Yorkshire Dales, a working class background, is um, now helping people help people. And do you know what I love is that there's this kind of stigma that you can only be a, a speaker or be invited to kind of run these workshops if you're either really well known or you're really poshly spoken or you've come from Cambridge <laughs> University. And, and what I love with what you do is, you know, you've kind of throughout your journey, you, you knew that you were good at what you did, but you knew there was a new, another step to take. Yeah. And, you know, like you said, you're from the Yorkshire Dows, you're a normal person. You know, I know I kind of said at the beginning, I had this whole kind of fangirl thing, kind of, oh my God, it's John Fisher. But, you know, for me, I saw the business part of you. When I did my leadership training, we were using your models, we were using your theories. So you kind of became this, this person that is the, the guru of change. And change is a subject that I absolutely love. 
so then to kind of meet you and chat to you and and kind of even from my perspective to just see that you're a normal person <laughs> with a normal background i think that's really going to help the students to see because some of these students will come from council estates normal estates and council estate boy yeah and they just they kind of feel like their options are restricted because of their background and that's so not true nowadays i think no you know they have uh, exactly the same don't they definitely i think back in my day options were a lot more restricted there were jobs you just didn't know existed yeah. um however just sort of going out finding looking exploring playing uh, around on there just helped me start working out what I wanted to do and where I wanted to go and it's I suppose on one level it's been comfortable making the wrong decisions yeah. and then learning from that decision um, some decisions I've made in life have uh, seemed right at the time but very quickly became obviously wrong and so moved away from them take what you can out of it and then move on and accept it's all learning yeah. uh, as part and parcel of that and I, I also am a big reader I love reading I still read a lot both fiction and non-fiction um, and travel on trains to work a lot um, going up to wherever I'm going in Scotland uh, down to Birmingham and London from where I live so the trains afford me time just to explore and see new things both out of the window and in the book that i'm reading as well so i constantly sort of do that playing exploring expanding those horizons um just to see what's next and still moving still going forward still getting new experiences and doing new things uh, and that's one of the things that motivates me and drives me that that you've got to see what's on the other side. Yeah, well, and it, it would be poor show if you didn't like change, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so I've done so much of it and come so far from it, definitely. And as a working class background, my father was a semi-skilled labourer. My mother worked in a in a mill, as a lot of Yorkshire people, certainly where I came from, do. So I had that as the background. Secondary modern school, left school before going on to sixth form and only went back at 33 and did the Open University and then took seven years to get a, a first class honours as well as part of that. So um, it, it's there and it's just finding that thing that attracts uh, and it's finding what doesn't attract is as important yeah. as finding what attracts. And once you get into what's really there for you and what's right, it will just allow you to grow and fly. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big one for that not all education is academic. You know, education yeah. can be life, it can be the people that you surround yourself with, it can be a Saturday job working in, you know, in the local pizza restaurant, you know, you mm -hmm. learn oh, totally. from all of that kind of stuff, as well Definitely. as your school and your academics, it's important, but there, as you get older, it almost kind of reduces the importance and life kind of yeah. makes it halfway, I think. I definitely i i would say where i am now and people have asked me about going on for a doctorate and, and becoming doctor um but i don't see the point because i'm what's called in my world a practitioner in i do yeah. I, I don't teach i do ironically i don't see myself as teaching although i do help support and grow but there's a quote that has been really one of my life mantras for a lot of years now uh, by one of the french philosophers that says it's my job to make windows where there was once walls and i really see that as what i do it's helping people see a different perspective it's helping them understand who they are I, and I would say one of the key things to, to anybody is that know yourself. What makes you tick? What helps you? Um, what drives, motivates you? What turns you on? What turns you off? And that will then help you start working out where are the good places to be. As somebody who likes people is interested in what makes people tick, working on little black boxes and pulling things out of things and having no sort of real human contact 
wasn't a good working choice. Um, it gave me a lot of skills that have proved valuable later, uh, but I stayed there far too long. Yeah, yeah. So, well, I mean, you've you've pretty much covered absolutely everything I, I could have hoped for today. So thank you so much for joining me and sharing your journey. And uh, I can't wait to see kind of where you're off to now. I, I get very jealous when I see that you're off to Portugal and places like that. <laughs> I get excited because I've been invited to local school and then you're on a plane somewhere and it kind of, you know, puts you back in reality a little bit. <laughs> but no, because you're also a role model for a lot of people with some of the things you've done and the brave decision two years ago to go on your own and to set up a really successful a consultancy service and to be in the top five um, with hopefully fingers crossed being the top one so you're uh, you're a good role model as well for somebody who's mm -hmm. made some decisions and made, followed them through and got to a really good place Dina so okay. really impressed with what you've done thank you so much that's really lovely um I'll go blushing <laughs> <laughs> But no, thank you so much for joining me and uh, I, I can't wait to kind of see what comes next for you. Thank you and for you and good luck and fingers crossed. Thank, thank you. you very much for inviting me, Tina. Really appreciate it.